Welcome back to Cancer Research Demystified. Today we're delving into spatial transcriptomics, a fascinating technology that allows us to unravel the secrets hidden within our genes. We've known about our genes for decades. We know that they're made up of DNA, that they vary from person to person, playing a small or big role in determining everything from our eye color to our IQ. The Human Genome Project even allowed us to sequence the human genome right from the start to the finish, essentially decoding what it is to be human. If we imagine the human genome as a bustling city at night, we now knew that the city contained buildings, cars, people and lights. But for each one of those things, we didn't really know what they were doing. We didn't know how the genes were being expressed. That was until what we called at the time next generation sequencing, although really that's kind of last generation sequencing now. At this point we knew that the cars could drive. We knew whether the people were walking or not, whether the lights of those headlights were switched on. In practical terms, this meant that we could take, for example, 100 blood samples from leukemia patients, compare them with healthy patients, and understand not just which genes are present, but which ones are switched on, which ones are working and changing when we develop that cancer. This new kind of data had enormous implications, not just for our understanding of cancer, but for how we could potentially diagnose and treat it using the switching on of these different genes as clues. So what's the catch? Well, despite this being an enormous development at the time, so-called next generation sequencing was still actually a bit underpowered when it came to understanding the enormous complexity of human tumours. You see, human tumours are exceptionally complex. They have many cell types and other structures. And although next generation sequencing can look at up to 30,000 genes, for each gene, it's just looking at an average, one data point across that whole complex picture. This meant there was some pretty significant unanswered questions for our bustling city. Although we knew that the lights that were switching on could be from cars or buildings, we didn't know which ones or where or where the people were gathering. We were getting enormous amounts of data, tens of thousands of genes per sample and whether they were switched on or off. But this data for each gene was just an average from that whole patient sample. We didn't know whether a gene was switched on or off in particular cells of different types, healthy ones, sick ones, or different regions of the patient's tumour. The more recent advent of single cell sequencing has allowed us to do this to a degree where we can now finally tell each and every car part or see gene expression for each and every cell. So now instead of looking at average gene expression across the whole tumour, we can disassemble the tumour and look at expression in each and every cell individually. However, by disassembling that tumour, we now have no idea of which jigsaw piece fit where. This, this key question of where is a bit of a tricky one for scientists to answer, and there have been a range of different technologies developed recently to attempt to do this in different ways. One quite fun approach is to hone in on individual parts of the tumour and then in a sort of next-gen sequencing style approach, look at average gene expression in that area. So for example, you might choose an area of particularly aggressive cancer cells or an immune cell rich area or an area of those supporting structures. However, some of the most advanced techniques that are just starting to come out now allow us to use more of a single cell sequencing style approach where we can hone in on an individual cell without dissociating it from the rest of the tumour and look at expression of thousands of genes in that cell right where it is. It's the best of both worlds and gives us an enormous amount of data. 
the scale of progress in this field has truly been staggering for us researchers. From a point where we had next generation sequencing that allowed us to look at the expression of thousands of genes, through to single cell sequencing where we could now do this for each and every cell out of hundreds of thousands. Then with spatial transcriptomics, we could tie this back to location all the way through to single cell tr spatial transcriptomics, where we've now got expression of tens of thousands of genes in hundreds of thousands of cells mapped back to exactly where each and every one was in a tumor. So we can now figure out how those cells are interacting with each other, supporting each other, helping the tumor to grow. And we can now identify potential vulnerabilities using this. And with this huge volume of data, it's no surprise that the discoveries are coming thick and fast. From learning how cells can communicate with each other, through to figuring out what this might mean for a patient's prognosis, through to identifying potential targets for treatments, all the way through to weird and wonderful discoveries like just how the microbes in and around your tumor might have an effect on that tumor. Now, this is a really small proportion of what's been going on in this field. It's so much data that, frankly, we haven't even begun to answer the amount of questions it can possibly answer. And what we have started to answer has required a whole new way of thinking around analyzing the data, sharing the data, how to visualize things, entirely new types of graphs, types of plots and figures and diagrams, just to try and articulate the phenomenal amounts of data and the entirely new types of questions that we can ask of it. Turning inwards now, what about us? What questions have we been asking? What small part have we been playing in this new frontier of cancer science? Here's another city at night, this time New York, and it's a photo taken by me. I had gone there in early 2018 to learn my first spatial transcriptomics technique. It didn't work out, but these things often don't when they're brand new. I picked myself up, dusted myself off, hopped over to Stockholm for some more photos of cities at night and learned another technique. Then back to our lab in London where I learned another and another and another and began comparing and contrasting. This has been something that has really fascinated me for a while now. And excitingly, we're starting to get our first data back that's actually showing us the amazing potential of these technologies. My team have begun to share some of our early findings at international conferences, and I'll share the links to the presentations below if you're interested to read them on a more technical level. But here's some snapshots of, of that early data. And in short, what we're trying to do is to understand whether or not we can build models of prostate cancer in the lab. So if you've been watching this channel for a while, then you know this is something we're interested in, trying to develop a sort of artificial tumor, either inspired by real life or taken directly from donated samples from patients in the clinic, and then keep these somewhat artificial tumors alive in the lab for a few days, long enough to treat them with drugs. If that's possible, then understanding how the drugs affect each and every cell and understanding how that effect varies across the tumor, the different regions that are more or less aggressive, the regions that have more or less of an immune system. This will really, really help us to understand how effective these drugs might be. This is something that is starting to work. It's exciting us a lot. It is an awful lot of data to analyze. And I did mention that the scale of this data is, is really phenomenal. So it's definitely a big learning curve for us in terms of the data analysis side of things. Um, as you may guess, AI is definitely starting to play a role on this side, which has made it even more exciting. But yeah, there's a little sneak peek into how we're using this technology safe to say we're learning a lot from all of the other researchers in this space as well and we're so excited each and every time a new paper comes out in this space. It's really been a lot of fun learning about this one. When I first heard about spatial transcriptomics back in 2016 from a colleague of mine I thought wow this sounds like the future, it sounds like sci-fi, it sounds like something that shouldn't be possible yet but it is. It's here, we're using it and we're really finding out more about cancer thanks to it. 
that's all for today thank you so much for listening if you enjoyed this please do stick around drop us a like and subscribe if you're so and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon